Welcome to Around the Empire. I'm your host, Joanne Leon. Around the Empire podcast, listener-supported, independent media. The website is aroundtheempire.com, and please pitch in if you can at patreon.com slash aroundtheempire, paypal.me slash aroundtheempirepod. Also, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash aroundtheempire. Elijah Magnier returns to the show. We discuss the uprising and protests across Iraq that turned violent this week, with over 100 deaths and thousands of injuries. Elijah's sources within the office of Iraqi Prime Minister Abdul Mahdi told him that the protests were planned during the summer months and the demands of the people are legitimate. The current Prime Minister inherited a corrupt system in a country struggling to recover from devastating war, sanctions, billions in debt. The protests coincide with an assassination attempt on the leader of the Iranian Quds Force, Qasem Soleimani, and Prime Minister Abdul Mahdi's office said that the objective now seems to be about creating chaos in Iraq and Iran, and the possibly a coup d'etat carried out by the military or encouraged by foreign forces, Saudi Arabia and the U.S. Elijah Magne is a veteran war correspondent and a political analyst with over 35 years experience covering the Middle East and North Africa. We recorded this on October 6, 2019. Elijah Magne is here speaking to us from Europe. Hello, Elijah. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. Hello, Joanne. Thank you for having me. So I read your recent article uh, about Iraq. I was um, not paying close enough attention. I didn't realize how how bad the, the protests had gotten. So I read your the great article. You give some background. Uh, also, for our listeners, you may want to go back and listen to an interview that Elijah did here on this podcast Uh, It was episode 68, uh, titled Iraqi Politics and Stalled Idlib Operation. And in in that episode, Elijah explained a lot about the 2018 election and the difficult time that the parties and the leaderships in Iraq had in deciding who was going to be prime minister and president and speaker. And that was the point in time when Muqtad al-Sadr actually got, his party got the most votes and it was a, a surprise and a sort of confused time. But the prime minister who was put in place, I think it was like a compromise type. Uh, I guess it's always a compromise in Iraq. And uh, the man in charge now is Adil Abdul Mahdi. Right, Elijah? Yes, that's correct. So he's been in place for just a little over a year or actually just about a year. And now he's got a big problem. And Elijah compared it in his article, which I will also link here for listeners. So for the past week, there have been basically protests that have turned violent in a number of cities across Iraq. And there have been almost 100 people killed, and I'm not sure how many were injured. There's Um, few thousands, several thousands. Oh, my gosh as if these people haven't been through enough, you know, uh, it's, it's upsetting, but you call this, the conditions similar to those that led to the Arab spring. There's, you know, completely justified grievances. The economics are still bad. The reconstruction has not nearly enough has happened and there's still severe corruption as there has been for, for many years. So, you know, we see the reasons for these uprisings, but it also coincides with what looks like some foreign interference. So, Elijah, just to I just kind of set that up a little bit. Hopefully you can explain that. Maybe actually maybe take just a couple of minutes to explain who's in power right now in Iraq. I know this is a complicated thing, but for anybody who is not familiar with the uh, the current leadership and the parties, maybe you could um uh, real quickly go over that well yeah that's a good that's a good start so basically let's i'll go back ex- very quickly on a time where uh nur maliki was in power and he was uh, uh, renewed 
uh, in his mandate twice with the pressure from Iran to keep him in office uh, because he promised to uh, ask the Americans to leave, and he did ask the Americans to leave, and they've left in 2011, ending the occupation of Iraq. After the Maliki, uh, there was a, a struggle in Iraq, in Iraq uh, who is going to replace the Maliki. Now, Iran wanted the Maliki to remain in power. The uh, Granatullah Sistani, for the first time, writes a letter asking uh, to remove al Maliki, not to allow him to stay in, in power and to have a third mandate. So uh, we had Haider al Abadi as a prime minister, and he was very pro American. And he was not anti Iran, but he did everything that the Americans wanted in Iraq, which is basically leading to a serious discontent of the Iranians. And um, during Abadi's time, the corruption was at highest. Uh, also, Abadi has inherited corruption from previous government. We're starting really from Paul Bremer, who was the head of the first team, who started to see a lot of uh, money in the country and benefited from it, to all the government that came after, starting from Ayad Alawi, to Ibrahim Jafari, to uh, Nur al-Maliki, and to Haider Abadi. And we saw a lot, <clears throat> many riots in Iraq, particularly in Basra, in the south of Iraq, uh, asking for reforms for uh, drinkable water. They didn't have that. For electricity, and they were deprived from electricity. And Basra is one of the wealthiest cities. We're talking about the oil production. It's the highest oil production in Iraq. comes from not Basra. And uh, after uh, Haider Abadi, uh, we saw the struggle between the head of the IRGC, because Brigade, Brigadier General Qasem Soleimani, and the representative of President Trump, uh, Brett McGurk, in Iraq, both of them fighting to uh, promote a prime minister that fits with, more with, with their liking. And we saw that Brett McGurk and uh, Qasem Soleimani agreed on a body without really meeting to agree on it. Um, and this is where, sorry, not a body, uh, Abdel Mahdi, Adel Abdel Mahdi came to power. And Adel Abdel Mahdi, at the first beginning, he stated very clearly his objectives that is related to Article 8 in the Iraqi Constitution. He wants to have good relationship with all the neighboring countries, including where the United States of America. And the Americans uh, are in Iraq no longer as an occupation force, but under the request of the Prime Minister uh, Haider Abadi, who asked them to support him to fight ISIS. And before him uh, was the end of Nuri al-Maliki. So with the fight on ISIS, the Americans return to the country, and they have between six to eight thousand uh, troops on the ground with a lot of privileges. Now, although Adil Abdel Mahdi, the uh, serving prime minister, uh, tried to create a balance, nevertheless, he upset the Americans on all sides. So, first of all, he did not dissolve Hashd Shabi that is a, a part of the uh, Iraqi security forces. Uh, second, he um, opened the borders uh, with Syria, and the uh, Americans asked him specifically not to do that and to keep the borders closed because they want to put pressure on the Syrian people to uh, starve them and to prevent uh, them from having any... Uh, basic life needs, so they can blame uh, the President Bashar al-Assad. And they also closed the border with Jordan, or they kept it open, but prevented 184 goods from crossing from and into the country. So basically, they more or less closed the borders with uh, Syria. So what upset the Americans even further, he uh, went to Russia to buy the uh, S-400 missiles, 
or he yeah. continued by signing a deal with uh, a German company, Siemens, to uh, bring electricity to the country and to change essential spare part of the actual electricity system and to um, uh, make sure that they can use the Iraqi gas that so far is not used. And uh, at the end, he also rejected the deal of the century, which is a deal between Israel and the Gulf countries on the Palestinians. And I say Israel and the Gulf country because the Palestinians have rejected any deal. And um, he said, I don't agree with the deal and I'm not part of it, like Kuwait. And uh, finally, he uh, mediated between Iran and Saudi Arabia to the request of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who asked him to go and talk to the Iranians and try to uh, de-escalate the situation in the Gulf. Now, all that, what came on top of all that, when he came out a week ago saying Israel is responsible for bombing uh, five warehouses of the Iraqi security uh, forces, Hashd al-Shabi, and therefore he kept the right to retaliate against Israel. Now, all of that is not only uh, his doing and his decisions, but basically the U.S. is considering Iraq no longer in the U.S. orbit, is no longer fulfilling the U.S. objectives in the Middle East, is not walking along with the Americans, is asking for uh, military support to train the forces to keep supplying the weapons, to um, maintain a training to maintain for maintenance of the weapons, and they have uh, uh, American jet, and they have a good military relationship between the two countries. But uh, Iraq is uh, showing its um, teeth against the U.S., saying, I'm not going to bite you, but I don't want you to impose on me and dictate on me your policy. So you asking me to uh, block all commerce with Iran, I'm not going to do that. It's a neighboring country. We need Iran, Iran needs us. I'm not going to block the goods on the population. And also he's taking electricity from Iran. And the reason why he has managed to provide drinkable water and electricity to Basra and calm down the people of Basra who were the first to start the uprising in 2018, is because he's providing them with electricity, drinkable water, and he made serious reforms in uh, Basra. Now, let us be clear. Adil Abdel Mahdi has inherited a very corrupted system and cannot deal with that in one year. There are hundreds of billions of dollars that have been stolen from uh, the state, uh, nothing has been done, very little has been done, and now he needs to do everything. And he's doing, he's trying, but projects need years to materialize. And the population cannot wait, rightly. They want their rights, they want job opportunities, they want to improve their lifestyle, and they cannot do that. And Adi Abdel Mahdi cannot really offer it because the government, the Iraq as a country, is under heavy debts. Mm. Right. So it's not that Mahdi is, has changed his position and gone totally pro-Iran. He is really just trying to strike deals that he feels are best for the people. And he's under, as you said, he's under a lot of debt. He's um, under a lot of pressure. Maybe, I think, unreasonable, particularly the sanctions. I mean, the maximum pressure campaign that John Bolton used to talk about, and now Pompeo is continuing, you know, they want Iran to cut off trade. They want Iraq to cut off trade with Iran. And as Elijah just explained, they basically, they can't. They can't do that. And the electricity and the oil that they're taking, it, it's not like they're doing that to uh, create a luxury lifestyle or something. We're talking about basic needs, uh, electricity and water. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, he seems to be in a position, or basically, we have put him in a position that's impossible. If he if he does, like, what happens, Elijah, if if a body does go along with all of the the demands from the United States? Adil Abdel Mahdi cannot go along with the U.S. demand for a simple reason. The majority of the country in Iraq, the 65% are Shia. And the Shia, they have a very important shrine in Iran to visit. And they visit on a daily basis. And there are thousands of Iraqi traveling between Iraq and Syria, and sorry, and Iran, to visit the shrine of Imam Riza in Iran. And there are tens of thousands of Iranians and Lebanese and other Middle Easterns and non-Middle Eastern Shia who travel daily to Iraq to visit the shrines of imams that are in Karbala, in Najaf, in uh, Baghdad, Kazimia, in Samara, and there are uh, uh, shrines of so many prophets in Iraq that for the for Muslims it's important in their ideology to go and visit these shrines. So Iraq cannot close the door on that. It is impossible. Iraqis and Iranians are married between uh, families and uh, they have uh, uh, very old ties. There are some Iranian words that are used in the uh, uh, in some dialect or some uh, uh, places in Iraq, like in Najaf. There are uh, goods that are coming from Iran that is very easy because there are uh, many uh, border crossing between the two countries. There is a very strong bond between Iran and Iraq, particularly after the fall and uh, the killing of Saddam Hussein. Iranian and Iraqis are really uh, two countries, but th their ties are uh, impossible to break. And because the, of the experience of the Iraqis who uh, went through the U.S. sanctions during Saddam Hussein era, and Iraqi population starved, uh, hundreds of thousands of children, men and women, died uh, because of the U.S. sanctions uh, on Iraq. They understand what is sanctioned on a population like the Iranians, and they don't want that. They don't want to allow this to happen. Yeah, exactly. I mean, let's look at the things that, that you laid out, the things that Mahdi did that caused the displeasure of the United States, which it just, you know, it just kind of disgusts me to even say that. I mean, who are we to dictate what he does? But um, so he said that, that there there have been bombings near the border with Syria, uh, just these bombings that happen out of the blue and... You know, at first, no one takes credit for it, so we don't know who did it. And in a sort of surprising move, Mahdi blamed Israel for it. Now, he must have pretty good intelligence. Do you think that is likely that that, that was true, that it was Israel that did those bombings? Well, first of all, Benjamin Netanyahu hinted to the bombing. Second, Israeli ministers said they are killing, they are the only people killing Iranians in Syria and destroying Iranian arsenal in Iraq because the Israelis accused the uh, Iranian of having provided the, the Iraqi security forces with precision missiles they stored in Iraq in order to bomb Israel or uh, to bomb other objectives in case of war between the U.S. and Iran. And therefore, this is what the Israeli did. That's one aspect. The second is uh, Iraq is not deprived from friends who are operating in the country. So let us remember there is uh, a joint operational room made by the Iraqi, the Russian, the Iranians, and the Syrians in Baghdad. And all of them have uh, many radars in the sky of Iraq. Actually, there's a very heavy traffic in the sky of Iraq and Syria. And according to intelligence reports, 
they consider uh, that these drones uh, were suicide and they've left from American base in Iraq and uh, one of them in Syria and they have uh, attacked Iraqi objectives. And the reason why is because there, are, there have been uh, a, a thorough examination on the ground and there are uh, radars, fingerprint um, of uh, the drones and the uh, flying object that came to Iraq from the Syrian borders and other from a uh, military base in Iraq. Now, let me explain to you the military base in Iraq. They are uh, uh, pri the uh, former Prime Minister Haider Abadi gave the Americans the authority to uh, exist in uh, with the Iraqi forces in the same base but separately. So the Americans can fully control a part of the bases they are spread on in Iraq, and they consider this as American territory. And the Iraqis are present in the same base, but in a different section. Of course, we're talking about tens of kilometers of bases. So there are a huge military base and the huge air bases that are spread in Balad, in Ambar, uh, a bit everywhere in Iraq. There are six or seven where the Americans are present. So they have the full control of the area they are present on, and they can... Uh, really offer support to the Israelis willingly. Yeah, we talked, and again, we talked about this, Elijah explained this in our last interview too, for anyone who's interested. Now, as far as opening up the crossing, at, at, is it Al-Qaim, uh, between Iraq and Syria? Yes, that's correct. That's mainly for trade, true? Sorry? That is mainly for trade between Iraq and Syria? Yes, it means trade between Iraq and Syria. It means boosting the economy of both countries. It means a, a, a substantial revenue uh, for both countries. It means the meeting of families because there are tribes on both sides uh, who live in Syria and Iraq and they are uh, families. It means uh, the return of a normal life to Syria and the return of a normal commerce to Iraq. Right. Now, the reconstruction, we're talking about basically the result, the fact that the infrastructure is either destroyed or old and poorly uh, functioning. This is something that's a result of, number one, uh, U.S. sanctions on Iraq going all the way back to the early 1990s. And, of course, the destruction from the war in, starting in 2003. So... It seems like there was a lot of time to do that reconstruction and presumably NATO allied company or yeah, NATO allied countries and their companies, uh, we would prefer for them to be favored in these kind of projects. So why has that reconstruction, like why haven't we helped? And why haven't we made that happen already here in the U S since we know that, um, you know, we say that we're trying to help the Iraqi people. So why has this reconstruction, why is it so far behind and why hasn't it happened all the way till now? Because the priority went to buying weapons and look after the security of the country. Now, Daesh was eliminated from every single Iraqi city, not from uh, pockets in Iraq and Syria, uh, not long ago. And Iraq has invested heavily on weapons and on the war on terror. Uh, therefore, Iraq needed to borrow money to uh, continue investing in the war on terror that is still ongoing. And uh, uh, it has requested from Gulf country to support it and has asked for at least 80 billions. Now, the Gulf countries accepted to give Iraq 40 billions and very little has been paid or invested in Iraq since. So basically, Iraq needs to sell its oil. And what Iraq is doing is like is making deal with the Chinese company to come and construct in the company in the country in exchange of oil. So what Iraq is doing, I don't have money to pay you. I have a lot of oil. I can give you oil and you come and construct my country. 
and the Chinese has accepted. And that created a, a serious upset to the Americans. So Iraq is trying to survive with what it has now because uh, there are problems with the Kurds in Kurdistan. Uh, there are problems with the oil income that comes from Kurdistan that is not, the revenue is not coming into the pocket of the central government in Baghdad. There are troops to be paid. There are the Peshmerga, 200,000. They say they have 200,000 on the list of payment that the government of Baghdad needs to pay. And there are hundreds of thousands of other security forces. There are institutions everywhere. There are uh, government buildings everywhere, municipality that needs to be fed and supported and paid for. There are hospitals that are uh, in need of uh, reconstruction. And all that is free of charge in Iraq. People don't pay money when they go to hospital. So all that needs a lot of money. The Americans are not stepping in to build the Iraq because uh, President Trump is uh, asking uh, the Middle Eastern to pay him money. He's not investing in the Middle East. He has no intention to pay any penny in the Middle East. Right. Yeah, I mean, I would ask my own government, well, then why didn't you help them uh, all these years with dominance in that country? Uh, now, granted, there was, you know, a lot of, there's been unrest, you know, there's been violence, there's been wars. Well, <laughs> but we're we're responsible for that. So I, I just don't understand why. They're putting pressure on Iraq for doing what look like reasonable things to me. Um, and it looks like just another case of trying to use Iraq as a wanting it to be a puppet to counter Iran. And, you know, Iraq is just to the best of their ability, not willing to do that. And they can't do that, as you've explained in a, in a number of different ways. Now, um, yes, yeah, I'm sorry. Right. But what is very surprising, I was shocked to see all these uh, Saudi um, accounts on social media right. trying to fuel the uprising and uh, uh, asking uh, people to come in the street. And so we saw that uh, on one hand, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is asking uh, Iraqi Prime Minister Adel Abdel Mahdi to go and mediate for him with Iran and to try to de-escalate the situation. And on the other hand, we see the electron, the Saudi electronic army all mobilized to attack Iraq and make sure that there's going to be another uprising. Now, the uprising can go nowhere because all the, all the main parties and organizations are represented in the parliament and they are in the government, in the cabinet of ministers. They are all there. You can't, what, kind of regime change you want to impose on Iraq when everybody is represented and there is a, a shortage of personality who can take over unless the U.S. has in mind some military uh, individual who, would who would, they would like to promote as a prime minister and um, uh, change the democracy that is uh, actually existing now in Iraq, one of the rare countries to a dictatorship. Maybe Saddam Hussein was not bad after all. In yeah, it sounds uh, like another Saddam. Exactly. Exactly. So this is what we are seeing. If Adil Abdel Mahdi was elected by the parliament, that was elected by the population. I mean, look at the Muqtada Sadr. He has 53 members of the parliament. He doesn't represent 53, but he managed to get 53 because he made a, a, a clever move by bringing different parties from the communists, from Am Ambar, from uh, the north, from everywhere in Iraq. He's not going to get that again, but he has managed. And today it's a fact that he represents, he has 53 members of the parliament. Uh, the Iraqis uh, have to deal with it because they, have, they are the ones who elected him. So it is an elected state. It is not a person who is imposing himself on the country. And the only thing the, co the population need to do today is to understand um, that the process is long, but to make sure 
that the government is fighting corruption, otherwise the government needs to be removed. And this is exactly what the Grand Ayatollah said, Ali Sistani said, first fight corruption seriously, create a committee that is independent and move on and remove the people who are corrupted. And all that is going to take time. But at the end of the day, we see there are no friends of Iraq in the region. And we see the Iranian flag are, is, uh, are burned in Iraq and Iranians are attacked. And we see Iranian passports shown on videos like it is uh, something very new. There are millions of Iranians in Iraq today and there will be uh, several millions in, in a week time when there would be a, a particular religious uh, event. So it is normal that you can find Iranians in every corner of Iraq. This is not new. Iran has supported Iraq uh, on the fight against ISIS, has supported the Kurds, and that's Masoud Barzani said it, when the Americans did not move in. And no one is saying anything against Saudi Arabia or the U.S. in all the manifestation in Iraq. So we see everything is directed toward Iran and we see the social media is directed to show only Iranian flags burn and Iranian passport in the street of Iraq. It's like you are asking, you saying, oh, there are uh, French people in Brussels. But of course there are French people in Brussels. Right. People travel all the time. Right. Now, your sources within the Iraqi prime minister's office said that he basically sees a foreign hand manipulating these protests and you compare it to, well, you at least compare the conditions to what happened before the Arab Spring. And now you're saying that uh, in the media or what we're seeing on the streets is an anti-Iran movement or portraying it as an anti-Iran movement. Um, so do we do we suspect that this is another color revolution type thing are these i th i think the protests i mean it's always complicated there are organic protests there are plenty of reasons to protest but do we see some manipulation here well the prime minister believes uh there is a serious manipulation first because there are 16 security forces who have been killed by bullets uh, second because uh, he sees on social media how how the uh, Saudi electronic army is moving to s support the uprising. I mean, uh, around 80% of the hashtag Iraq is uprising uh, come from Saudi Arabia. And now suddenly the Saudis are in love with the Iraqis who they have always despised and uh, attacked. And now they feel they have to support the Iraqi uprising. And also because of the series of events where Iraq took unpopular decisions to the Saudi and to the Americans. And last is because Iraq is not closing the doors on Iran. And today, Iran is the enemy in the Middle East and for the Americans. So therefore, Iraq is not considered Iran as an enemy, but as a neighboring country, exactly as Saudi Arabia. And that is not uh, pleasing, neither the Americans nor the Saudis. And uh, the Iraqi prime minister sees a link between all the events, the assassination attempt against the IRCG general Qasem Soleimani, uh, who has a, a good influence in Iraq, so removing him will allow, will, will uh, a bit disorientated the Iraqi politicians who used to rely on Iran to pick up their brain and see what are the best moves and strategy. And Iran uh, played a role to unite some groups that were not united uh, among the, the Iraqi politicians, exactly like the Americans did when they came, when Brett McGurk was active in Iraq to try and promote his candidate as a prime minister, as a president, and as a speaker. So the prime minister of Iraq, Adel Abdel Mahdi, sees a link between what he said, the Israeli attacks, 
the Americans uh, discontent that the American uh, diplomats came to him and told him they are not happy about what he's doing, particularly with Iran, and um, see the Saudi behavior. And according to his view, all that is linked and cannot be uh, detached. There cannot be uh, single events. They are all linked together with the event that's happening on the ground. Fortunately, there are no leaders yet on the ground, but social media is a good organizer. Yeah, um, Patrick Coburn mentioned that. He said that he said that the whole thing was triggered by the riot police. And I'll just read a little quote. He said, the riot police who have a bad reputation in Iraq opened fire with rubber bullets, stun grenades, and eventually live rounds. Soon a video was flashing around social media of the protesters, mostly under 20, being attacked by the police and hosed with hot water. It was this incident which turned a small-scale protest into mass demonstrations which may bring down the government of the prime minister. One of the strengths of the protest movement is that it has no leaders, but is almost spontaneous. But of course, this also, uh, he mentions that this also gives uh, Mahdi no one to negotiate with. Now, Muqtada al-Sadr is a, for me, a confusing figure. As much as I've learned about him, I still don't understand the guy. Now, are these the people on the streets? Are they, is is that his um, faction? He's known for uh, having the ability to, you know, cause these uprisings. How much, how much of a role is he playing in this? Um, for your own peace of mind, I don't think Muqtada understand Muqtada <laughs> behavior. So I know Muqtada very well, and uh, I met him in many occasions and I interacted with him uh, so many times during my presence in Iraq and my trip to Iraq and I have a good access to his mind. I think Muqtada Sadr's behavior is typical and hasn't changed since 2003 until today. Muqtada Sadr rides the wave and he comes out and he tries to adopt what is workable and what is uh, he thinks is going to give him some popularity is not working now because he went exactly against what the Marjaiya said. The Marjaiya and Najaf said the members of the parliament should assume their responsibilities and particularly the biggest coalition in the parliament. Now, the biggest coalition in the parliament is him and the other Shia groups. And he has suspended his activity, the activity of the mem- of his member of the parliament. That doesn't go. He's retrieving from assuming his own responsibility. That's one. Two, it, it, the, those who are burning Iranian flags in Iraq are, above all, Shia who are uh, under Muqtada Sadr because he taught him, taught them to attack the Iranians in every single demonstration because he hates what Iran did to him and he considered Iran is responsible for splitting his group in different parts. Therefore, he goes to Iran and he attacks Iran. He goes to Saudi Arabia and nobody understands what he wants. I know when he did the visit to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and I have feedback from the people who were there, that nobody understood what he wants. So, okay. therefore, uh-huh. uh, what Muqtada is doing today, he is riding the wave of the protester, and he's saying there is a corruption. Well, you people are in the, in the parliament. Then ask them to do something about it. Your people are in the cabinet. Why are they not doing something about it? Why are they not raising their voice and acting and putting an end? He's getting his percentage from all the deals, this is what used to be the common uh, practice of every single minister uh, before Adil Abdel Mahdi. And he used to be part of this. Therefore, if you look at all his entourage, the very close in the circle, they are extremely rich. And I know them when their galaba used to be full of marks of oil and rice when they used to walk in the street. So, 
uh, Muqtada Sadr today is going nowhere because he's only trying to support the uh, protester verbally and the other candidate who is doing exactly the same is uh, um, Sayyid Ammar al-Hakim and both are against Ab uh, Adil Abdul Mahdi. They both wanted Abadi to be re-elected and they both are, uh, they have uh, uh, um, a, a grunge against Iran. Yeah, so let me mention this one last thing to you. I was talking to Issa Blumi and I also read some recent articles, things that happened at the energy conference in Valdai just a couple of days ago. The Saudi minister, you know, stood up and announced that the Saudis are back to full capacity. They're exporting, you know, they're recovered uh, from the attack and they're now exporting the same amount of oil as they did before. But Issa Blumi said that they're actually getting oil from Iraq and, you know, possibly to, maybe they're really not back up to capacity, but they're relying on this oil from Iraq to um, bring their export numbers back up. So is this, is this a factor in yes, the whole it, situation? Yes, it is. Iraq is supplying Saudi Arabia with oil, and Issa Blumi is right in what he said. He's an excellent uh, academic, and he's a good analyst, particularly on Yemen, and he follows the Middle East very closely. And um, uh, Saudi Arabia will need months to return to compensate the uh, failure of production of 5.7 million barrels per day due to the recent attack, drone and missile attack. So the pressure that the Saudis, if, if the Saudis and the Americans are behind or at least fueling these protests, you know, is it to keep Iraq, keep that oil flowing from Iraq? Is Iraq resisting or not pushing enough oil to the Saudis? And also, uh, Blumi mentioned that some of that oil is probably coming from Iran, ironically. Well, that's correct. I was just about to tell you that Saudis are buying Iranian oil. Uh, more or less. Iran is selling in Iraq between 700 to 900,000 barrels per day. Okay. This is, it's hard, it's hard to understand what, what more Iraq is supposed to do in order to, you know, stop. I, it sounds like it doesn't really have much to do with, you know, pressuring Iraq to do, to do more things. It sounds like it's really part of the war, as you mentioned between the US and Iran and that this they're also taking the opportunity to blame anything bad that happens during these protests they're going to say you know Iran did it and it just hopefully not but to create a, but it sounds like they're trying to create a reason to attack Iran or at, le at least it's part of this confusing hybrid war yeah and everybody is against Iraq, and Iraq can do very little about it. I mean, I saw on social media an account for the deputy military attaché of Iraq in Washington. So he's a member of the uh, government. Uh, he's at the embassy. And he was saying in Sadr City, first armed resistance by the people just started. So he he is also joining the campaign against his own country. What does it mean, armed resistance? Yeah. That is an armed resistance fighting, shooting against the uh, security forces who are also Iraqis, part of the government, part of the system, part of the population. And by the people just started, so they just all, everybody's waiting for uh, an armed resistance. It's exactly Syria 2011. Yeah, yeah, you do mention that, and right. <laughs> Let's hope that they don't go down that path of an armed resistance. Uh, I, you know, I see Iraq being. I don't. I don't see what they can do other than what they're currently trying to do is to create some kind of a balance between the influence of Iran and the United States and its allies, as like Saudi Arabia. This is a really bad situation. Uh, um, I guess that's a. I'm being Captain Obvious here, understatement. Well, what else can we talk about before we wrap up? I, I 
this is it, it's very worrying, you know, to me, um, because if they do overthrow the government, if they want to bring down the government. As you said, who who do they want to put in there? A military, well, uh, another, another Saddam? elected prime minister, or another military, another Saddam Hussein, maybe. But it, it already it took them a lot of time and a lot of negotiation and a lot of compromise and a lot of wrangling to bring this prime minister in just a year ago. So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I don't see, I don't understand what the objective is here, a reasonable objective. So... Or maybe they regret removing Saddam Hussein. Well, I think there's some val validity to that. I mean, there are people here who are beginning to admit that, you know, everything we did in the invasion for Iraq uh, ended up benefiting Iran, the one that we were trying to work against. And, but you can't fix that now by, I mean, this isn't any way to fix that. Uh, it's done. What's done is done. Yeah. All right. Well, I should let you go. And anything else that you want to say to the listeners before we wrap up? Well, I think there is um, something in favor of Iraq that didn't exist in Syria that Iraq is not governed by a president uh, that has inherited of his father. It is governed by a prime minister that was elected by the people. And if he's not good and not fit for uh, ruling, he will, uh, another person will be re-elected. But Iraq should definitely do everything in uh, their power to stop the appointing of a dictator in the country. Iraq has suffered enough for 36 years under Saddam Hussein, and since 2003, it still continues suffering. And I think it's enough for the Iraqi people they need to be aware of that they are uh, moving against the same government they have elected. They should be careful who to elect next time. Right, I agree. All right. Well, thank you, Elijah. I'll include your Twitter account, your website, and that's at the website is where you can support Elijah. Thank you. You're, you're mainly on Twitter and your website, right? Yes. That's okay. Cool. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Elijah. Thank you, Joanne. All the best. Thank you for listening. Special thanks to Elijah Magnier. Follow Elijah on Twitter at EJM Alrai, EJM A L R A I. Read and support his work at his website, EJMagnier.com. The Around the Empire podcast is independent media. Your support is really important. Please pitch in if you can, patreon.com slash around the empire or paypal.me slash around the empire pod. There are many ways to listen to this podcast. You can find it on any mobile podcast app or on the website aroundtheempire.com or on patreon.com slash aroundtheempire or on YouTube, youtube.com slash aroundtheempire. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, leave some comments or send some feedback and suggestions by email, admin at aroundtheempire.com and follow on Twitter at aroundtheempire. And we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.